me and my girl are like, we don't get why everybody else thinks it's a big deal, you know? It's like uh, in the porn world, there's nothing controversial about us when it comes to that. And then the rap world, it's controversial. But that's not the world. That's what I'm saying. That's not the world. It's not just porn and rap, bro. Like, that's mm. not the, the Well, like, to me, that's the two businesses that I primarily exist in. Forget, can we ever say forget business at all or no? Well, we're talking about content. I think, see, I think that's where we differ. Because you don't do porn, so you don't understand that it's content. I ain't talking about porn. Fuck porn. I'm talking about doing on camera people. I'm talking about being a person. That's porn. People having sex on camera is pretty much the definition of porn, right? No, I'm not talking about business. Okay, move on. <laughs> I'm not talking about business. That's what I'm saying. Like I know. I just I already talked about this a bunch today. It's kind of boring. What, the the porn? Yeah, you can just keep bringing it up. Man. It's just, I'm over it. My bad. It, it must have hit a nerve or something. No, there's no nerve. I just like, I already talked about it two times with two other people, and I feel like I've kind of made it clear that I'm kind of over talking about it, and you keep drilling into it. I, I'm just trying to, like, pick your brain, I guess. I, I apologize. Know. I'm just telling you, move on. Okay. We're going to get straight to it then. What's good, man? You already know what time it is. Your boy, Mr. J. Hill. J. Hill Podcast. We in the building. Special guest is in the house, man. I told you we're going to just keep on going, man. And literally, when I say in the house, we in the building, man. Adam22 is here. What up, dog? Bow, 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 bow. Hey, man, don't come here with the gun shit, man. My bad, my bad. Hey, we man. just start, we heard some gunshots outside. <laughs> you ain't hear, you ain't hear no gunshots. I don't know, man. You ain't... Security said he heard gunshots. He's an expert in this field. Man, not out this much. I don't know. He definitely, when he said gunshots, I'm like, you know you ain't hear no gunshots. Like, I know for, that's the last thing I'm worried about. Is gunshots you, or fireworks. That's the meme. Definitely fireworks. Like, <laughs> we bought a baseball stadium. So, you know, you if you bought a baseball stadium, you know you bought the white people. We bought, mm. bought a good, the, the good. This is a white area? I Kinda. feel a little more at home when you say that. Okay. I, <laughs> nigga, you don't, I feel like, I don't know what you, I feel like, I don't know. Do you feel more at home? Because you with a lot of black people nowadays, man. I they, feel at home everywhere I go. You that's because you came in like five security. One. <laughs> At home, I do my own security. For the you see how I try to throw that in there? Yeah, you yeah. came in with five security. Five. You moving like academics five out here, bro. would be crazy, man. I mean, you got to. I've never seen Ag with security. Bullshit. Nah, if he, I've been if, to his spot mad times, but if, I also never seen him go out in public. I'm going to say, if Ag don't have security, then that's just not smart. I see him in Vegas on his story with no security. That's just not smart. He was going to the Super Bowl, I think. Mm -hmm. I like how y'all pulled up though, like yeah? real incognito. I would have never thought, I thought it was gonna black truck it, you know what I'm saying? I mean, my security, he got a car, it's a little car. Well, oh, right. that's his car? Let's hop in the car, yeah. Oh shit, you got family? <laughs> 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 he pulled up in the SUV, like. I mean, shit, we probably would have been like $700 worth of Ubers if we had been getting cars instead of driving around in that thing, so fuck it, I'm I mean, in that you thing. getting money, you rich. Yeah, but you know, you never want to disrespect money. I like that. You know, like I was saying, I feel like you. Um, you say you feel like home. I feel like you've been hanging around a lot of niggas lately for the last couple years, mm. decade. Shit, my whole life, really. I mean, since I got off the porch when I moved to New York, started riding BMX every day with a bunch of kids from Brooklyn and Queens, and at that point. It wasn't intentional, but yeah, I guess primarily. I always wanted, like, because, bro, when I hear you, um, when I see you on interviews, I always see people, like, trying to, like, come for you, so to say. Mm. Like, hold you accountable and under the fire, right? Well, how do you feel about people saying you're a culture vulture? Yeah. That's, Shit a, like that's that. a real creative well, one. Well, not that. Or, like, people <laughs> saying culture vulture, people saying, of course, you coming up off the black man, you um coming off of, like, Gangster shit, mm. dead people, mm. like shit like that. We can get that, get there. But I wanted to ask you, like, how did it all start, bro? Just from from somebody that like that sees your work. You're you're a vet in this, man. You've been doing this for a minute. Like, like how did it all start for real? Um, it all started just because I was riding BMX bikes since I was like 12 years old, and then when I was about 22, 23, I started a BMX website, and uh, that just basically took over my whole life for like 10 years. And then 
moved to LA, started a bike shop, was doing interviews with BMX riders and shit out of the bike shop. And then at a certain point, uh, had, had, you know, some success interviewing underground rappers that weren't really getting interviews yet. And I just kind of realized like, Oh shit, I got a new lane right here. I can just, uh, interview all these motherfuckers and just kind of use that as a entry point into the scene. Cause like, I was always just a big hip hop fan, but I never really thought that I was going to have like a role in it or, uh, you know, do anything creative in it. You know, still to this day, there's a lot of stuff that I'm real into, but I never thought about, uh, you know, producing content about I'll play poker. I don't really make poker content. I fucking, but the hip hop thing, all of a sudden I just kind of found my entry point with all these grimy ass little underground, underground SoundCloud kids. But even then, it wasn't like, there wasn't, it didn't start off grimy because you, I feel like you kind of introduced us to like Triple X. Mm. Um, I don't know if it was Trippy Red. Like you had a, a bunch of those interviews at first and then we ain't start seeing like the gangster shit or, 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 or gang yeah. banging stuff until a little later. Yeah, I feel like in the pandemic, we kind of started to, you know, because SoundCloud really by like even 2018, 2019, shit was kind of dying off, you know? So I kind of had to like uh, just start like going out of my way to like go down more rabbit holes in terms of like, all right, let's really take a look at Memphis. Let's really take a look at Atlanta. Let's really figure out what's going on in Chicago and let's really try to like stay on top of all the shit that's coming out of there because it's like even in Chicago alone, it's like a couple times a year or many times a year, there's like the new hot rapper really like over and over. And, uh, you know, we try to just kind of be at the forefront of having conversations with all the new talent coming out and shit like that. You think that's one thing that a lot of, um, I guess, I'm going to still call them journalists, like overlook when it comes to uh, doing interviews and doing content or podcasts, like just those guys in the inner city? I feel like you got to find your niche and like sometimes your niche changes because like if I had just stayed committed to just Finally. SoundCloud type rappers, you know, this shit would have fizzled out a long time ago. So I always like I'm trying to figure out new areas to expand into. And I think that, you know, documenting what's really going on on like underground level. At first, that just really meant like this sort of SoundCloud scene, and then we've kind of expanded out to try to stay on top of everything that's going on in all different areas, you know? Mm. What Did you come out with, when you started doing that, the academics have already been out, right? Yeah. Like he yeah, already yeah. did the, like, the war and shower rap. Yeah. Um, shit like that. Yeah. So did you, was a lot of that inspired by act, would you say? Well, we didn't really get into, like, doing anything, like, super deep into the Chicago scene until really, like, I think Remo is what kind of pushed it over the edge in terms of him just being such a huge fan of that. And when I brought him onto the team, he started, like, very much going out of his way to line up a lot more, like, deep Chicago uh, interviews. But not even just Chicago, but, like, like you said, like, you started to look at different yeah. cities. But was I inspired by uh, the Warren Chirac? For sure, I used to watch it. I never really thought of myself as doing, like, that kind of content. I could think of it just as interviewing people mm -hmm. but definitely like i feel like one thing that makes us stand out is that we're not afraid to ask people about shit that uh you know a lot of people would be very standoffish about asking like you know if you make your gang affiliation clear in your music we're gonna ask about that you know if you beefing with people on instagram live we're definitely gonna ask about that um whereas like i feel like a lot of platforms try to like provide like a really polished version of a person like we really want to get the real real version tell us what's really going on and a lot of times you can get that out of smaller artists and you can't really get it out of bigger artists right so but really it's like about doing whatever people are comfortable with you know i can interview a a mainstream rapper who's got some crazy street history and if they don't want to talk about you know what they got jammed up doing when they were 18 then you know we could definitely skip it and talk about other shit but in terms of like what our specialty is i think it's definitely just providing that super real version of who somebody is yeah yo it's funny how did you how was you able to escape not getting caught up in the streets? Because, like, for example, like, we might joke about it, but you like, we never seen academics, like, outside, right? Mm. But, like, I feel like y'all talk about similar things, not exactly the same, but similar things, and it could be easy for, like, some gangster to want to run up on you, right? Mm. But you never got caught up in none of that. Like, how was you able to, like, escape that and stay away from that? I think most important thing is just that as much as I'm having controversial conversations with people, it's like very rarely does anybody leave upset. You know, usually when I do an interview with somebody that's like the shit, especially if they're like a smaller artist or an underground artist or whatever, it feels like it's the best day of their life. And 
I don't really usually say things during the interview that's going to necessarily like even piss off their ops or whatever. When I think about LA, it's like there's a million different neighborhoods, a million different cliques and things going on. And I do my best to just stay on good terms with everybody and, and, and work with whatever artists are coming out of whatever areas. And, you know, you also just got to move accordingly. You know, you can't, can't be moving around like everything's all good. People would love to get a piece of content out of whooping your ass. So you got to just be smart about it. And also, I mean, you get your ass whooped. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. Keep on moving. But you never, like, was worried about that? Like, so, for example, I, um, it was just, I think I just seen academics talking about it. Like, um, I think I seen Ray Daniels and my guy Ferrari Simmons on, on the radio station. They were saying how right. they don't talk about street shit in Atlanta because, like, niggas be outside. Yeah. And I think Act made a really good point. Basically, like, man, well... How the hell you gonna grow, right? Yeah. Like I, I grew my, my 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 platform as big as it is because I wasn't afraid to talk about this shit. Right. And I look at somebody like you, like similar you, shit. Everybody that they talk shit about the Vlads, the uh, shit. Even D, somebody like a DJ Small, like they, they talk shit about their questioning. But it's like these guys are. You see the growth in that platform. Yeah, I was just talking about that with uh Baby Jade mm -hmm. and the whole Big Facts Pod and shit. But they, you know, they they have to constantly make that decision. Like, you know. I mean, he's an easy example, but it's like an Atlanta legend. Let's do it. Like, Young Thug. Yeah. I'm cool with Thug. I got a good relationship with Thug as far as I know. I've been around him a bunch of times. He's always shown me love, shouted me out on different interviews and shit like that. Um, but if I really want to be a great content creator, if Thug drops a, a, a horrible album, and, like, it's good to be hypothetical with him because he's been gone for so long. If I can't come on the podcast and say how I really feel about that album – then what the fuck am I? Like, what am I doing? Mm. You know? And like, yeah, I want to maintain my relationship with him and everything like that. But I think that if Ak has shown me anything, it's like, if you have a good take, it could be a negative take. But if it's a good take, if it's well thought out, if you actually really like manage to, you know, say something real and, and say it in a way that doesn't attempt to be super disrespectful, but really puts it out there, then that could be, you know, you, you can talk about somebody's situation in a way that, won't necessarily be seen as disrespectful but i mean i'll give you an example is that like i do podcasts with whack 100 and brick and they both don't really get along with yg i interviewed yg a few years back hadn't seen him for a while seen him at a party the other day went up to him to shake his hand his response was nah y'all talk shit about me every day <laughs> <laughs> and i had to just laugh and be like damn i didn't even know all right and i was just like all right cool but it's like what Am I going to like, like we have real conversations about YG's career because he's like one of the biggest rappers out of the West Coast. I mean, I can't really hold my tongue that much. You know, it's like if he puts out a project and the, the sales are bad, I didn't even listen to it. That, that would probably be a whole different conversation if I actually listened to it. But to me, I feel like I'm having fair conversations about him, but I understand how he could get upset because I'm sitting next to people who are basically just shitting on him. Mm. Um, You know, that's a risk you got to take. Like ultimately, I would like for... YG to have enough respect for my platform to be able to understand that I'm out here having conversations about him and that he should really be thankful because every other rapper from his age range in LA, people who came out in 2009, 2010, where are they at? Mm -hmm. They're all gone. We ain't talking about them because they're irrelevant. He's still relevant. So we're talking about him. He might not like it, but you know, do ultimately you, I got to do my job. Do you think it's easier to have, like, let's go back to the small artists real quick. You think it's easier to have these conversations around these artists and about what they going on when you have such a big platform? Like, was you was you always like that even coming up? Or was you was you a little reserved coming up? And then you kind of start jumping out there. To start, I was not dipping my toe <clears throat> into the controversial hip-hop takes and opinions pool at all, you know? Because it's kind of like, there's multiple things you can do as a podcaster. You could talk shit with the homies. You could interview people. Or you could talk about current events and topics that are going on and i feel like that's not something i did for the first few years in terms of like oh let's figure out what's trending right now what's interesting what people want to talk about what we want to talk about and let's do a show but really i've probably been doing that since like 2018 i think is when i started the no jumper show and uh yeah you know it's like i would be able to get more interviews if all i did was interview people and didn't like also talk about their album sales or talk about whatever but it's like you know i feel like it would be too much of a compromise if i just stayed silent about everything that's going on in the rap game 
in order to offend less people. You know, I, I would prefer to just be able to be out here and have my real opinion. And if they don't like it, maybe we could talk about that too. That would be the best case situation. And if not, cool, we're going to keep talking about you. Mm. Yeah, you know what I, I like about this shit, bro? I ain't going to lie to you. I, I, I do like the fact that no matter what people say, this is probably one of the realest things you're going to get. And I'm going to try it lightly because we do have the cameras. So I know a lot of niggas, a lot of people can talk shit and do any, do things for the sake of the camera. Mm -hmm. But there's a difference to, to ask somebody exactly what you think or tell them exactly how you feel when you face to face. Mm. I feel like that's probably one of the most stand-up things to do. Now, it's different when you just popping shit on the camera. You hiding, you know what I'm saying? But you just talking shit. But when you could sit down with somebody be like, yo, I, I don't like that or I didn't think that was right. I feel like this is probably... Some of the the realest shit to do when it mm. comes to having conversations, talking men. Yeah, it's a, like content and interviews and shit is really about respect. At the end of the day, like if somebody really respects you, they're probably going to be down to sit with you and and have a conversation. That's why the game is kind of crazy now because you got somebody like Lil Yachty starting a podcast. <sighs> he got a lot of respect. Somebody like Jay Cole just go do do his yeah. podcast because he's you know these guys are kind of like music industry elites. Like they're in the game. They respect each other as artists, and they uh, mm. have both achieved like a certain level of success. And you know that's kind of different than the 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 come up of somebody like me or Vlad, who's you know involved in it in different ways. But we're not necessarily like rubbing shoulders in the beginning, at least with the biggest artists. Um, so, but also like if Yadi got the reputation that I have of being willing to ask all the craziest questions, it might not be as easy for him to. Uh, get as many guests you know he might ultimately kind of change the way people view him so i mean really like i just feel like my obligation is to the streets and the people who are the people i run into when i'm outside who want to see me do interviews that oftentimes don't necessarily make me the most popular person to mainstream hip-hop industry people yo you know it's funny that you, i'm glad you, you mentioned the little yachty shit because like i used to be a hater mm. like especially when it kind of like Joe Button, anybody that was popping and did a podcast, because I felt like, bro, like I'm coming from nothing. I don't got no affiliation. I ain't, I wasn't no rapper. I ain't had shit going on. I just came up just out the mud, right? Mm. And I had to think about it like, nah, bro, they should they should be able to do that. They reaping the benefit. They reaping what they sown, if that yeah. makes sense. Like So like, you put in a lot of work to be a rapper, so you should be able to pivot and do some other things. Yeah, and I mean, it says a lot about the podcast game changing because when I got into the podcast game, I felt like I was starting something that was so weird and and freaky and hard to explain to people because they just weren't really used to it cuz I think even at that time like the breakfast club wouldn't put their full interviews on yeah. YouTube from what I recall I might there might be some exceptions to that and stuff but even at that time Vlad put all his clips out just just short clips and I'm out here doing like an hour and a half long interview with an underground rapper and all the comments were just why the fuck would you talk to this guy for an hour and a half this is way too long I'm not going to sit through this now, in this day and age, sometimes when I do an hour and a half, I feel like I'm short. cutting it short. Yeah. It's like, damn, I, I could get two and a half or three if I really was patient with this guy. And uh, now, doing a podcast is so normal hmm. that somebody like Yadi could just get a podcast deal and just pop in for an hour or two a week and just do it, and it's no big deal. And, I mean, I respect it because it's, it's, it's not that big a deal. It's like, especially if you have a team behind you that can handle setting up everything, you know? It's not the biggest deal in the world to sit down and talk to somebody for an hour, especially if you already have a big ass audience of fans who love you, mm -hmm. who are going to watch everything you do, which is pretty much where Yadi's at. So uh, that kind of keeps the competition up because, you know, I want to do a J. Cole interview, but mm -hmm. J. Cole, he's probably going to sit with Yadi. I get it. Not so right. that means that I got to keep putting in the legwork to figure out who I'm going to talk to that'll make my shit stand out, you know? Let me ask you this. Maybe not now, but let's go back a couple years, right? Mm. At what, when did it change from, or or did it change? That was it like, yo, okay, they could be an underground person, but they still, we we know it's a difference. Like, you got underground niggas that still got clout. Mm -hmm. like, I could do an interview with my guy like YG Tech and it's still going to go up because he we, he got Baltimore on lock, mm -hmm. right? But you got some people where they just famous. Was you looking for a story or were you looking for the, the clout when you first started? When I first started, I was really digging in the crates like I was just interviewing like anyone you could be a random DJ a random person who worked at a label a random manager like I was just going with whatever I could get at the time because I felt like oh well if I interview this person 
who, you know, has a clothing line and they want to interview so they could talk about their clothing line and their clothing line is kind of dope, but yeah, I know it's not going to do that many views, but maybe I'm going to do this interview and then that person's going to fuck with me. And then I'm going to be able to lean on them to be like, Hey, you know, that rapper that you fuck with, like get yeah. them to do an interview with me. Yep. I was doing a lot of bullshit like that at the time. And I was doing a lot of like, that shit worked though. It, I mean, it did kind of work like overall, <laughs> but I, I, I really like have these fond memories. I remember there was a weekend when 21 Savage first came to LA and he did like uh, two shows, like one in the OC and one in uh, LA. And I went to both of them. And I was like DMing his uh, manager, Key, early on. And she was like kind of giving me the runaround, but kind of fucking with me in terms of like, th there was definitely a chance I was going to be able to get him to do an interview. And I went to both of those shows and I lurked backstage and I tried to get a conversation with him and it didn't really work out. And I never got the interview. But I look at that and I'm like, bro, that's badass shit that I fucking took two nights out of my weekend to just go. And granted, I was having a good time probably. I was probably chilling with some girl, bringing her around, doing whatever I was going to do. But, you know, putting in those hours of like really just trying to make something happen because it didn't happen. But it totally could have happened. Like I got a Young Thug interview. 99 times out of 100, I probably wouldn't have got that Young Thug interview. But I put my neck on the line and just went out there and managed to get Juice World to introduce me to him. And got one of the best pieces of content I ever got. And, uh, you know, that shit is not something I take for granted. Like I, I, I almost kind of miss that because I probably wouldn't really have the time or like pulling up on like, yeah, to just really stage, backstage type shit. Even this week, I look at it like that. Like I went to the fucking Drewski show for six hours, hanging out with everybody and just shaking hands and meeting people. Just, I don't know if I met anybody that I'm going to interview, but at least I like got a little bit of connections to people that will help me get a little bit closer to making some dope shit in the future. I feel like, yo, you want to think about that. Like, when you first started, I feel like it wasn't, like, a lot of podcasters to look at. Nah, right? yeah. So, like, even now, I feel like it's kind of, it's great to see, like, y'all doing y'all thing, but it's also, it's like a gift and a curse because now, of course, it's internet, right? And I don't even call, like, Instagram. Instagram, I call it IG for instant gratification, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, people look at, like, an Adam22, or academic, it's a Joe Button, and they don't understand the work that niggas put in, and they be like, I feel like, it's easy to be like, man, I want to be able to pull up to a Drewski sh show backstage and talk to all the rappers and shit. But it's mm. like, bro, you put a lot of work in for that. Yeah. And I got a whole team. I got a publicist who actually thought about getting me passes to the Drewski show when I didn't even know it was happening. And like, even that, that's like, I mean, one way to look at it is like, damn, he's privileged as fuck that he's got a team who's doing shit for him that he doesn't even know about. Nah. And then another way to look at it is like, damn, I'm, you work I'm proud that I like have put together a group of people that are able to like you know help me achieve stuff the other day we went to do the YSL Woody interview and I forgot to tell the filmer that we were going to need the camera set up that the studio that we rented was just audio we didn't have cameras set up so he immediately just snaps into action and gets puts his iPhone on a tripod and and gets the other yeah. camera going and then I see him while I'm doing the interview. I notice he borrows the security's phone mm -hmm. and takes thumbnail photos of us. We back in the trenches. I didn't even say anything to him about getting the thumbnail photos, but he's automatically thinking like the whole process, you know. And it's like I wouldn't have been able to blame him if he didn't get them, mm -hmm. but he knows that he can go a little above and beyond by doing the shit without me even asking him, and that makes me super proud. Shout out Hurley for uh, like just having people on the team that are. Not just phoning it in, but really like, you know, trying to stay on top of every little thing because that makes it so much easier to get a lot of work done, you know? Mm, no. Nah. Yo, how you feel about like all these podcasts coming together and like falling out? Like even speaking of Lloyd Yachty, like he just went on the internet going crazy yeah. on his homie. Yeah, I don't know if he's done or not. I feel like he, he well, might. Well, even that's kind of corny though. To like, bro, not your friends been the shit and be on the internet, bro. Like, I, I don't know what type time this new shit. I, I don't know who to believe on that because like on one hand, Yachty definitely put that Mitch fool on, like he fucking for sure. But the blew him shit. up. But I mean, I, I mean, also like I don't know. A lot of times you'll put somebody on and then they won't live up to it, or they'll be kind of a dick to you or whatever. Honestly, I didn't, I didn't pay enough attention to that situation to really like know who was at fault. It just ended up kind of looking bad for Yachty because it happened at the same exact time as the Caribou thing. So it's like a lot of people are saying like, oh, pulling a Yachty is like doing something for somebody and then reminding them afterwards and kind of rubbing their face in it, which I, I I think that's probably unfair, but he kind of got smeared with that as a re result of those two situations happening at the same time. I, okay, so I'm not as familiar, but shit, we here now. 
It was you had a similar situation though. Yeah, we had like a bunch of different hosts on No Jumper that I built up over a period of time and kind of like f was slowly like falling out with a few of them and then they a bunch of people left at the same time and then Did they leave or did you fire them? Uh keep it real. 90% of them they just left. There was like one person I fired, but now he's back. Okay. <laughs> but uh you know it's like that. It's like, you know, the ups and downs of me trying to create a whole network and shit like that but i mean a lot of the people who left they got a rude awakening shit's not that easy it's not easy to get guests i heard a whole lot of boasting saying oh we're gonna get the biggest celebrity guests no i, I seen, seen some of them niggas turning up now what's the what's the guy? fig immunity something like that i don't know you know nigga. i never heard of it <laughs> you cap bro you don't have to you don't have to be like that you know what the fuck is going no, on I, in I, I heard about them a little bit but i don't really know what they got going on so you so all right, beef us. Well, whatever the fuck there was. Aside, you can salute some niggas when they they step away and start doing their own thing. If not, then you turn into the white man for real. No, nah, for sure. But if they do something dope, I'll I'll salute it. They created something dope, no? You start a YouTube channel. You said it's hard as fuck to do that. It's salute hard to make them, great content. Salute them, the young men. Give them their respect. I, I'm this one hundred percent. I'll be the one doing it when they do something dope. Okay. What the fuck is going on? Pretty sure that's Remo and everybody. Why we just go upstairs and get him? Come on, man. We gotta be smarter than that. But it's cool. It's cool. It's cool. It's cool. You my guy. Y'all can get him. Mm -hmm. Uh, but um, okay. Yo, so when did you want to start like hiring people anyway to like put on your to do all the shows and shit like that? Do interviews? I mean, I think like in 2018, I just kind of had this like realization of. Me doing interviews is dope, but ultimately, if I want this platform to last, I should probably diversify. I should probably just get more faces. And especially at that time on Melrose, where I had my store at, or where we still have a store at, I was just like meeting people all the time and just kind of just like being around people. But I think at that time, I was a little like slow to like really embrace people's talent and put them on camera because I kind of felt like they had to be able to do exactly what I do which is like be able to hold a, a dope, full-length, in-depth, two-hour conversation. And at a certain point, I just realized, like, they don't necessarily have to be the one driving the boat. They just got to be able to, like, rock with me and mm -hmm. make some content consistently, you know? So, uh, yeah, I'm always just trying to, like, develop talent and bring people on. It's, it's tricky, though, because it's like you'll find somebody, and the easiest thing to find is a crash out, somebody who will come on camera Go crazy. Be there, bug out, say dumb shit, make people hate them, probably say shit that's going to make people want to beat their ass, et cetera. Uh, you know, just basically, like, people love to watch somebody implode. People love to watch somebody just fuck their life up. So that's, like, the easiest thing in the world to find. But, you know, it's it's a lot harder to find somebody who can really have, like, great conversations over and over and over for, for you know, years to come. Um, but, yeah, I'm always just kind of looking for – for people who are capable. And a lot of times I find people who I fuck with, but they're not quite there. And it's like, I don't really have the time to Mold put them. them through podcast <laughs> class for the next couple of years to try to like yeah. work out the kinks of what works and what doesn't work. But I do consider myself somebody who's like really got my ear to the streets in terms of like paying attention to people who would be dope for this kind of opportunity. You know? I'll be scared as fuck to work for you though. After like, you just fire everybody and then, the but that's not even close to true. Like, who do I fire? In terms of the talent, I the mean, only person I ever fired was Lush. And then, bro. But and, then, and then we work things out. But, Adam, we can't, you can't ignore your platform. It went from, like, dope interviews to, like, almost a reality TV show at this point. Yeah. And, like, niggas but, fighting but I feel camera. like that's not really, like, I feel like that was just the result of me putting a lot of people on camera. I don't really feel like I did a lot to like inspire the drama and the reality show side of it. Because to be honest, if you look at No Jumper for, for like the last few months and shit, it's like there's no internal conflict. Even if you really look at it for like the last year and a half, there's like no, there's very little like internal conflict. It's just people will have opinions about, you know, celebrities and public figures and they get into it. But I mean, the narrative that I like I'm have fired a bunch. Of, yeah, but I mean, like camera. But that, like, you saw my reaction when they started fighting. Like, I 100 percent did not see that coming. That was like, 
you know, and I, and I hate to just be like the one just saying, hey, it ain't my fault, but it's true. Like nobody in that room would say that's my fault. And the narrative that I've like fired a lot of people is like, Lush is the only person I really fired, to be honest, in terms of like talent, like on camera talent. It's not many. So I'm out the loop. So the, the the people you hire and they they lit from what West Coast, like they lit. They had some shit going on. Like what made you hire these people? Like yo, come on, get on camera. I mean, a lot of times it's you like can shut the door, bro. My it's bad. somebody who was a rapper or you know had something going on, and usually it's like kind of not a hundred percent working out. Yeah, we it's all the, good. It's ghetto on this motherfucker. It's all good. So, uh, you know, I'll just kind of, I mean, it's tough. Like, it's honestly, like, really hard to find people. You'd think it would be easy because just being a rap fan, you end up meeting a shitload of people who basically, like, know a lot about rap, and they're cool. They're cool to hang out with. They're funny. They're, they're you know, they got some good opinions from time to time. And then you put them on camera, and you really just start to pick them apart of, like, everything that they're good at, they're not good at. It's like... There's so many things that are liabilities. Like, you know, it's like you put some kid down and we're going to do a podcast. And then at some point you realize he doesn't know anything about G-Unit. He doesn't know anything about Dipset. It's like it's cool to be a hip-hop fan and not necessarily have encyclopedic knowledge of right, everything that me. happened before you. But it's like I can't – I'm not going to be able to have a podcast to the best of my abilities with somebody who doesn't know no, at all. basically yeah, like yeah, all yeah. the shit I know. So it's like, no, that's, that's kind of fair. a tall order. That's not, so I was But gonna, ignorance is not cool on, on in a podcast. It's not. So it's like, Depending you can have a how, strong, wrong opinion about G-Unit, but if you just don't know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was it, about it's say, like the conversation <laughs> just yeah, screeches to a halt. Yeah, yeah. Fuck, I need to find somebody else to talk about this with. No, you're right. And it's, about, it's not like, you know, Rick Baby sitting right over here now. He probably doesn't remember every last thing from G unit the way I did living in New York at the time and being like singularly obsessed with it. But he probably could have some good takes about that. Cause he's been a lifelong hip hop citizen. And that's why I think like, you don't really see a lot of people having success as podcasters in their twenties. Usually it's like, once you're kind of into your thirties that you start to be more capable because when it comes to being a good podcaster, people really want to see you have like a lot of knowledge about the culture 100%. And, and so that's it's kind of a tall order, you know? I feel like you don't have to do that as an interviewer, though. Cause I, for exactly. Example, and that's I, why I think interviewing is easier than talking with your homies. For real? Yeah, because, like, what, what the, the hardest game to play is you talking with your homies and putting out content every week. Because it's like, you know who does a ton of views? Drink Champs. But they always are talking to a guest. Flagrant, always talking to a guest. Vlad, always talking to a guest. They Flagrant do not always talking with a guest. You're He's right. About You're right. But the vast uh, majority of their big episodes are, no, that's a uh, brilliant idiots. But okay. Okay. Flagrant is Andrew Schultz's podcast, but like he does incredible numbers, but it's mostly him talking to gigantic guests. Yeah. You're right. I'm thinking of Brady. What here. Joe Budden does to me is like playing the game on the hardest level that's because different. he's just sitting with a couple of dudes who realistically you didn't know who they were before they came on this podcast. And then they're, having a three hour conversation multiple times per week. So even though me and Joe Budden don't hundred percent get along or whatever, I got to acknowledge that's, that's the hardest game to play. And there's almost nobody else in hip hop. Like we, we do it, me and Wack do it. And I do the Tuesday show with brick and lush and, and we have, you know, pretty solid numbers and everything. But that, that to me is the hardest thing to do. I was doing it with Wayno and like, Shout I don't want to, but I'm not, first of all, I'm not about to sit up here and try to argue with Wayno about no hip hop shit. This nigga is 43 years old. Encyclopedic knowledge. He's a great podcaster for bro, that reason. Yeah, you get what I'm saying. But like, bro, I'm not about to argue with. He started when he was 16. Mm -hmm. He was in New York. I'm not winning. And a conversation, even me, I feel like I know a lot about Rockefeller. I'm gonna look like the dumb guy in the room doing a podcast clip talking about Rockefeller with Wayno. It's just gonna be me asking oh, nah. him about he it because he, me apart. he was oh. mega up close and personal to it. So it's like. Even that right there. But that's dope because you, you, you got to love doing a podcast with somebody who can really be like teaching you about important shit from hip hop, you know? But I think for him, he got kind of like irritated because like he was just so passionate about that shit. Mm. Like we did a few episodes. He just know that shit. And I'm like, bro, I don't know, nigga. Like relax, like teach me. <laughs> but I feel like on camera, like you said, podcasting is, is not a great space to learn, especially if you got a name to yourself either. And like, sometimes you got to have the humility to realize that 
your life and the shit that you've been through is not the most interesting shit to everybody else. Now, when you're talking about Rockefeller, it kind of is because you're like talking about some of the biggest rappers of all time. But like for me, a lot of the underground rappers that I came up interviewing, I don't even tell you people when I talk about my origin story, I don't really like name them off because you're not going to know who they are. It's like people that didn't really, you know, they might add a few videos, hit a million views. And it was enough for me early on to get a couple hundred thousand views interviewing dudes. But it was, it's not, they're not household names. So it's like, I'm not going to sit here and tell you war stories about me being in the trenches, doing coke at underground rap shows, fucking hanging out with all these dudes that realistically like were never that big in the first place and they're basically nobody's now. So you got to kind of always like know your audience as well. But shit, I'm supposed to do an interview with Lil Tracy. Me and Lil Tracy probably going to end up telling a bunch of crazy ass war stories about the old days of SoundCloud rap. But I say you never know, bro. Some of that shit can hit because like out your way they got the uh, white belly. What is it? Uh, soft white underbelly yeah which and is crazy to a bunch of homeless people <laughs> because when i was downtown my first bike shop people used to always say that like yo y'all should interview a bum interview a, a fucking junkie because there were so many of them everywhere downtown la and uh i always was like no i can't do that it's gonna look crazy mm. to be fair mark does it and he does a great job of it but he's a very careful interviewer he really like cares so much and he's empathetic and soft and he doesn't title it clickbaity there's all kinds of people talking to homeless people that do like super crazy thumbnails and says he's off he says he takes 50 blues a day yeah exclamation point exclamation exclamation point that shit is like i mean shit i kind of respect it because i get stuck I watching you, it once in a while don't you do you do a little bit of clickbait oh yeah yeah, yeah for sure and you get shit like isn't that the whole what, what i'm gonna ask you because i'm not going to assume what was the issue with you and joe the issue, uh, there's like so many levels to it, but like the initial- Give us the origin. We were always cool. And then I went on his podcast and he really tried to like do the thing where he like went in on me about doing too much street shit and talking about federal ass questions or whatever. But that, that was fine. We were still cool after that. But then I think he got mad because I was doing a little like a celebration victory lap on the podcast a little too much, talking about how I whooped his ass on the podcast, one on, uh, you know, four on one or whatever. Cause it was like a bunch of dudes and me and then, and he wasn't really feeling that. And then, but the, the primary sin that really pissed him off was somebody on my news team posted about some of his old domestic violence shit. Cause like, I don't even know which story it was honestly, but like one of the girls that he's had shit with in the past, they came out saying some shit and he was mad that we posted it because he's saying that's old shit. Like, why are y'all posting about shit where there's not, there's nothing new being added to this. It's not news. It's just somebody from my past that I feel he felt like they were lying or they were misrepresenting the truth. And so he's saying, like, you know, why did y'all post that? And I, and I remember the day because I remember texting him and I was boarding a flight and I'm going, I'm lo lo loading my luggage up, whatever. I'm already in a fucking pissed off mood. And I remember I was like a little rude to him about about taking the post down or something. And uh, I think that pissed him off. I think that's like really where it got started. So why y'all that would have known? On my rap song I put out, I told him that if I had seen him in the strip club, that I would have smacked the shit out of him. <laughs> and I think he responded, but I didn't see it. But I were think, you serious though? Nah, I was, obviously I'm not. I'm not like a fighter. I always got you know security with me out of town and shit like that. So nah, I have no desire to punch Joe. I I, I think he might have responded though, but it was like an Instagram. Somebody put it on their Instagram story and said like, "Ha ha, Joe chalking shit." But I haven't. I, I assume somebody was going to post it in the Reddit. But it might be like a Patreon exclusive or something. I don't know. So did you ever apologize or anything? If you were just joking, like, did you try to clear it up? I mean, like, the rap thing is just jokes, so I'm not definitely not apologizing for that. But I, I did apologize kind of about being uh, too careless with his feelings and his reputation, et cetera, by not being quicker <clears throat> to take that post down. I should have been a better friend when it came to that. So, so cause I, it, I can acknowledge that I was wrong in that situation. Because on here you say we don't see eye to eye, so I'm assuming like it's still issues, but it sounds like, you were the issue, Adam. Like, it sounds like yeah. you ain't, you should have just been a man. But, but then, you know, all right, so this is just to get even deeper into it. He, when I was going through shit, when I'm getting exposed or canceled or whatever, when all those dudes left the podcast, he had an amp radio show, the Amazon thing. Mm -hmm. He gets on my ass like, yo, you haven't talked to anybody about this. Do, do a, a conversation with me over the phone about it for my amp radio show. And so I did it. 
And I had multiple people in the music industry that I trust tell me not to do it. Just hit me up. Like, don't do that shit with Joe. He's going to use it as an opportunity to just be a dick, and he's going to – it's not a good idea. And I'm, like, thinking, nah, me and Joe are boys. I should have listened because he definitely took it as an opportunity to not not treat me with, a, you know, a, a kind hand by any by all means, which – to be fair, given how that Instagram post drama went up, what went down, I can't really 100% blame him. So I got to accept responsibility for even him doing that, you know? But also, even, like, I was going to ask about the integrity piece. Because mm -hmm. I feel like, again, bro, I'm not here to judge your, your, your platform. I think you did a great job. But as far as, I feel like people challenge you when it comes to integrity mm. of hip-hop, right? I feel like you run your shit like a business. Mm. Who knows? Joe could have been running his shit like a business, right? could have... And it had to be personal, right? Where do you draw the line between integrity and this is just business? I mean, one way to look at integrity <clears throat> would be to say that if somebody on my news team posts about a woman describing her domestic violence situation with a famous hip-hop podcaster, that me taking it down just because he's somebody I have a relationship with, that that's not the greatest example of integrity, right? So I Wait, think a lot- It's not? Because if that's somebody you got a relationship with- that would be integral. Okay, so if Harvey Weinstein, I guarantee you Harvey Weinstein had great relationships with a lot of people that worked at the TV networks and shit, right? But when you're talking about Harvey Weinstein, you're talking okay, about you and your Harvey friend. Weinstein's a pretty good example though, right? It's like, if a, if a woman is coming out and telling her story and people think it's newsworthy, just because you own that platform, because you're friends with somebody, you're gonna yeah, delete so, it? That's the opposite no, of integrity. If I do it, so for example, right? If, if I do an interview with somebody, matter of fact, Lecrae D1, right? So they had like a few. I asked Lecrae about D1. Mm -hmm. I'm an interviewer. I'm going to ask the question. But shortly after, I'm like, yo, D1, just letting you know, I had Lecrae on here. We talked about you. Because that's my homie. That's a, somebody I call a friend. Mm. That's integrity. Now, depending on how they look at it, I don't know. But that's what I look at. Did you put it out? Yeah. But I at least hit him first. Like, yo, just want to let you what know. What if he didn't want you to put it out? We would have to talk about it. But at least I did my part and let you know, like, yo, or how do you like this? Right? Now, if he don't like it, we might have to talk some more. I don't know. I ain't, we ain't get that far. But usually it'd be cool, even if it's not cool. They'll try to play the upper hand but over the man. A lot like, of people end up just having a hard time, like, wrapping their head around the whole situation with, like, I run a news page. I have a bunch of people working on it whose job is to fact check shit. And, you know, granted, our news team was a little less evolved at that point. But, you know, it's like a lot of times they'll post about somebody that I have a cool relationship with. And that person will hit me up and be like, what the fuck? Like, I don't want that up. Mm. And I gotta be like, yeah, well, I mean, it's news. It's like it's not really, it's not about if you want it up. It's about the fact that it's newsworthy. And you know, it gets really complicated when you're talking about shit that is like, you know, domestic violence or assault or whatever shit that like really could permanently smear somebody's name. And that's why it's dope to be able to do interviews where you could, in theory, like be able to get the right version of the story and be able to drill in and ask all the questions that you want to ask. But a lot of times, when it comes to the news shit it's just spur of the moment. Like we're just posting shit like, you know, and it's, you don't really get a chance to dig in the deepest that you want, but it's also like, you know, if there's somebody on my team that thinks it's really newsworthy and they end up putting all this information together and making the post, when do you take it down? What, what red flags have to go up in order to take it down? Cause the standard can't be, I like the guy. Yeah. Because nah. if I, you know, I probably, if I worked in the movie industry or whatever, I probably would have liked Harvey Weinstein. Not to say that Joe's like Harvey Weinstein, but, you know, no, you Harvey Weinstein was able to pull all kinds of switches and levers to get stories killed before they came out about him for years and years and years before it spilled over and it was unavoidable. No, I mean, I'm listening. You know? I, I think it's a tricky right. situation. How do you even, because I think that's the most annoying part about doing this interviews because you sit down with somebody, you have a great conversation, even if you talk about some shit that's trending. Even if it's not that bad, they want to pull it. And it's like, bro, come on, son. Like, and then you the bad guy when you don't want to pull it. So I, I get it. Mm. How do you, how was you able to navigate through that? Do you just not pull nothing? Because I'm pretty sure you had rappers or artists like, yo, can we take that part out? It's like, bro, what? It is weird because it's like, if it's newsworthy and it's not hurting anybody. Now I can understand like, you know, there's shit. I could think, I just thought of a rapper. I do not always show the integrity that I might sometimes feel like, you know, it's just it's just never that simple. Like, there's a rapper that I can think of right now, and we got a cool relationship. And there was, you know, his girl went on a crazy rant at one point talking about him beating the shit out of her. And I, uh, you know, it's somebody close 
to the brand, somebody that like I respect and I fuck with a lot, probably nobody would guess it. And I told the team, like, I don't want to cover this one because I know this bitch and I know they're getting back together. And sure enough, they're back together. And maybe I got a little too much empathy for him because I know that if we had posted that shit that it probably would have uh, – fucked up some serious financial opportunities for him and shit. And I felt bad for him because I didn't even know if I believed her, mm. you know, just as like a person close to the situation. I was like, you know, it really feels like she's just saying everything. So I, I mean, feel like you saying somebody that we all know. Yeah. I don't even think, you know, what I'm talking about, but the girl, some of them might put it together. The girl's not famous. Oh, I thought you was talking about uh, the chick that did millions of dollars on OnlyFans when uh, she came out and said her boyfriend was beating up. Then they got back together. Oh, uh, bad baby. Yeah. That's what I thought. Nah, you were talking nah, about. Nah. I ain't seen her in a while. <laughs> Yo, what's how the hell you get into porn? Shit. Like, bro, and you getting mad shit for this, but I feel like this is like something that you just been doing. Like, what the fuck? Like, yeah, I got into it like when I met my girl, you know, we just kind of slowly got into it together, just being freaky, just getting it in, you know. Horny motherfuckers. Yeah, exactly. But how do you feel about like people like I seen you did the, the conversation, the four hours conversation with Act, right? Mm. And the other the other guy that covered the uh Trap Lower Ross. Yeah. Bro. You must got, like, when you're talking about, like, what is it called? Hard skin? Paul is like. Elephant skin. You ever yeah. touch an elephant? No, nah, I haven't. Feels fucking crazy. Bro, it's crazy because, like, you got niggas saying, yo, let me fuck your wife. Bro, that's that's <laughs> crazy, bro. Like, you Listen, allowing but, a nigga to fuck your wife. But you got to understand that that's just, when you're in porn, the whole idea is to create a fantasy for people. No, but your, your, your peer saying, all right, then let me. Sit next to you, be like, right, he's a me. fan. He's horny. Bullshit. What am I supposed to tell him? We're out here making content to arouse people. And I can't, you know, it's different for me because I'm in this world too. But it's like, you can't blame people for having this kind of interest in people when everything you do is meant to create excitement around the sexual content. Like, I, I hit me up saying that he was uh, not going to report on it when she did the scene with another dude. And I told him, the like, black guys I'm like, hell no, right? you got to report on it. Like, you got to. And he outdid himself. He fucking did a whole reaction <laughs> stream or whatever. Honestly, I didn't really see it, but I heard it was hilarious. So, uh, you know, I invite that shit. The whole point is to get media attention. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. Like, YG not shaking my hand is that media attention is a goddamn gift. You know, as soon as that shit, like, let's, let's say you fast forward a year or two and nobody gives a fuck about YG anymore. He's going to be sitting there thinking, God damn, I wish that motherfuckers would report on me. Facts. Because there's a lot of people out there, shout out Bam Man Kevo, from talking to him, I realized how much value there is in paying people to talk about you. Bam Man Kevo is on the totally opposite side of this shit, where YG is famous for like a very obvious, normal thing, making music. Bam Man Kevo, what the fuck is he famous for? I don't even know. Just selling, selling courses, <laughs> fooling people into saying he had a BBL, <laughs> talking about crazy shit, you know, and it's like... So he didn't actually have the surgery? He had the surgery, but a BBL is where you put the fat in your ass. I mean, we know that, but we, right. we call it BBL Right, now. right. But, like, but for, for him, he'd been paying Say Cheese. He'd been paying No Jumper. He'd been paying all these pages to post about him for years and years and years. Because he's he knows there's a lot of value in being a celebrity. YG doesn't get that because he, he'd been a celebrity for a long ass time for like normal shit. But when that attention runs out, I mean, we, we see it all the time. Motherfuckers will do anything. One is enough enough. Like, this is your wife. You got a kid. Like, mm. bro. All right, one thing to let a, a nigga, a nigga, fuck your wife, right? Cool. Mm. Y'all into that type shit. But a peer? Nah, I don't disrespect me like that. Who's my peer? Oh, you're talking about Ak? Yeah. I mean, he's fucking around. He's doing content. He knows. Listen, Ak's not. He, he knows that, that would be a bad idea. Bro, y'all was on a podcast and he said, well, let me fuck your wife. Right. But you think he really wants to do that? It sounded like he was serious to if me. If Ak really wants to do porn, I think he should do porn. We ain't talking about doing porn, bro. <laughs> we talking about your peer asking you to fuck your wife, bro. I ain't talking about doing porn, bro. I know, but I mean, I think that you are kind of like maybe forgetting that when we all get together and talk on camera that we're doing content. It's like it's meant for the people at home to take it very serious. Yeah, you're right. You know? Nah, why do we draw the line in this shit then? Because it's like, hey, maybe hey, I'm being My real. line is not everybody else's line. What's your line, bro? I mean, shit. You guys see it playing out day to day. So you'll do, like, you really, 
Joe started his content over everything. You really COE, for real? No, nah, not at all. What I mean, won't you do? The, I mean... What's the line for Adam22? The line is forever fluctuating. I don't know what the line is. No way, bro. So you don't have a soul? No, that's not true. I just told you the line that there's a line. You are willing to do anything for My some content. My Overton window of what I consider acceptable for content is clearly a lot wider than the average person, but... <clears throat> to me, it's like I'm really just being myself out in public. Now, there's trolling and shit like that, but it's like, for the most part, I'm just being myself. Mm. Anybody who like moves around with me, they're not out here like secretly having conversations, being like, yeah, you know, Adam's like this on camera, but he's really like this off camera. Mm. It's pretty much the same. Yo, you know, I'm not gonna lie to you. I'm gonna keep it funky with you. Like in this game, bro, I I think I had that battle with myself often of like. Mm. Do I want to say fuck it and just let the work be the work? Or do I want to have some type of integrity, morals about myself and not talk about certain shit, keep it, you know, black and white or straight up and down, be a man, be a real nigga. But I be looking at the people that really came up like, and again, no disrespect, but like you, Charlemagne, academics, like Charlemagne, it's changing, like, turning over a new leaf. I mean, all of y'all kind of turn over a new leaf. But, like, Charlamagne, we seen him being a real asshole at first. Now we yeah. big on mental health. He cleaned it up. Yeah. So it's like, and a, and a part of my being a young journalist or being, like, somebody that's coming up in the podcast game, I feel like that's the only way. And then just, just change, turn over a new leaf later on. You see that sometimes. There's a lot of people out there doing content that, especially in, like, the red pill world, that, you know, it's shocking, it's provocative, but also it's like, damn, that shit going to really close doors for you forever. You know, whereas, like, you know, we just did Big Facts. I don't see them compromising themselves either. But well, big facts ain't comparatively, it's been kind of like a slower grind for them because they don't do some crazy, off-the-wall, provocative shit, right. you know? They're actual Atlanta hip-hop industry legends. You know, they've got infinite relationships that are going to basically stop them from having a lot of conversations I even felt it when Brick said somebody something about somebody he doesn't get along with on that shit, and they all clammed up. And I was thinking, like, what the fuck? He ain't even from your saying, city. Term, you got no reason not to talk about him. That's a terrible example. Because, like, again, you got um, Baby J, who's been moving in Atlanta for years. Like, right. fucking with Big Meech. You got um, Black on air. Yeah. Right? He's a OG in this shit. And then you got motherfucking Scream, who's mm -hmm. been doing mixtapes with rappers and shit. Like, so they have been had names for themselves. But that's... Great for them in the sense that they all have tons of connections, know tons of artists. They got tons of people who are going to tip them off about new artists and who's in town. And that, that's awesome. But what about also, young nigga? when Adam, it comes time to talk some shit, they're not lining up to talk shit. Right. Because they got all these relationships. You what know? about the young dude? The young dude that's coming up in the game. The young dude coming up. I mean, I see it all the time. Like a viral moment is extremely valuable. But it's the, the easiest thing is to go viral by making yourself look bad. And it's very difficult to go viral by making yourself look good. Yeah. It's almost impossible, really, for most people. Because what are you going to do? You're going to just ask, like, an amazing question in an interview? I mean, reality is, is the podcast market is fucking flooded. And the likelihood that you're going to get the superstar to answer the right question. Because even if you got Lil Wayne right now, mm -hmm. he ain't going to say shit about the Super Bowl. So You know? So that's, like, the perfect guess, the perfect time. Right, probably not going to give you the perfect answer to, to the so, question. So what I will say is, you don't have to ask it that question. So but I that's did, the best question. You don't have to ask. That's I, the so, viral question. So, so I, I did an interview with Ti, right? Yeah. I'm not going to say exact. We talked about some shit, and I got an answer. Mm. And granted, he he looked at it after and asked me to take it out. But was it about his time with women in the past? What? Nah. Oh. What the fuck, bro? Was it about him getting caught with mad pounds of heroin? No, it was about him and Boosie. Oh. Oh like, yeah. Well, there's one. Yeah, but. It, like what, nigga? You talk about the? Why do you want to bring up that? The fact that he has a crazy ass lawsuit with like a million girls suing him and his wife. But I fuck with Tip. But, but I also know that if I was going to interview Tip right now, I wouldn't even try to ask that. But why would you? Yeah, why would you even bring that up? No, no. Oh, I, I mean, a real interview, you ask everything. See, that's why I think integrity. Because you care about your relationships too much. No, it's not about relationships. Yes, it is. I don't. For me, I don't have no relationships. I don't give a fuck. You want Tip to like you. You do, right? I do too. Bro, we had a whole... I'm not even proud of this. Me, T.I., DJ Drama, like, 
I know I made it. We had whole arguments. Like mm. I, I can show you threads, and I think that built that made our relationship better. We was going back and forth. Me and Ti, nigga, DJ Drama called me on motherfucking some holiday because I retweeted some shit that Meek said because we were talking about the, who the J, who the new Jay Z mm. out of Drake and whoever it was. You know what I'm saying? So like, I don't give a fuck about these niggas doing content is really like it, it is a good way to get well known but it is a very bad way to become well liked yeah but it is some like so, when i'm saying like integrity like if i like you or not like you had you had some shit going on with some chick or somebody said mm -hmm. but as a man like why would i bring that up that don't got nothing to do with and that don't yeah. got nothing to do with like interviewing for that, some shit just okay be but brought I'll, up. I'll put it this way like a real professional like interviewer who wants to provide the complete package me and me and vlad have a great relationship vlad the first time we ever did an interview he asked me about that shit we've done 10 interviews since then he never brought it up i think that from his sense. perspective in order to really be like a true interviewer if you're going to have an ongoing relationship with somebody especially at some point you probably should touch on the ugliest realities now to be honest like if, if you were to ask me about that, I'll probably give you the runaround. I'll probably just be like, whatever. Because I feel like I already talked about it so much. It's so old that it's just like, I don't really feel like, you know, you, you got to know like where your expertise is and what your comfort level with the guest is, really. I, that's what I don't like, though, bro. That's another thing I don't like. I feel like a lot of these celebrities, bro, and maybe it's because I'm, I'm coming up and I'm, I'm, I'm not patient enough, but I feel like a lot of these celebrities, they don't respect the job especially from somebody that's coming up. Because mm. there's a lot of questions that I'll ask somebody that's like, I've done interviews with a lot of people and I'll notice that they'll answer the same question that I asked if it was Nori or mm. if it was Joe or if it was Act because they respect that platform. They see yeah. it, it got somewhere. Whereas though I'm coming up, it's like, I ain't giving this little nigga that. I'll give you even the most extreme example is I seen Jay-Z doing an interview with like Larry King and he's just asking him the most basic hip hop questions you could ever imagine in a million years. That if I asked him that, he would be like, what the fuck? This is like a little kid question. Mm. You know, it's all like a respect thing. You know, it's like reality is, is that now there's so much, there's so many options available for you if you're a super, or if you're a celebrity that it's like, you know, you could go do, if you have some real serious shit to talk about, you have a whole pick of different people who will provide you a good shoulder to cry on, who will not try to make you look bad and you know, a lot of times if you're up and coming trying to do the hard hard hitting journalism thing with people who realistically like don't have to do it. Yeah. It's just that's not it, it's a good idea, but it's just not really gonna work that much because so many people are just gonna be like, nah, fuck this. I'm not, you know, I'm a lot of people like they don't wanna be they don't wanna feel like hoodwinked. They don't wanna feel dragged into a conversation that they weren't ready for. But I'll give you an example. Like I interviewed this dude the other day, it was like a white guy. Johnny Mitchell, he got a podcast where he interviews shitloads of like criminals and gang overlords and cartel bosses. He did uh, prison time for trafficking marijuana. And uh, at one point in the interview, and, and keep in mind, this is a guy who's been interviewed by Andrew Schultz and a bunch of other like really big podcasts and shit. So it's like, for me to just sit down and do the same exact interview that Andrew Schultz did, it would be, you know, it'd be like a waste of his time. The audience would notice, like, why are you just asking them to retell the same exact stories about him getting caught trafficking weed, blah, blah, blah. I had to, like, just sit down and have a real-ass conversation with him. And at one point, I said, I asked him a question. He told me it was the best question anybody ever asked him in an interview. I just asked him, like, did you, as, like, a normal white kid growing up in New Orleans, or, excuse me, in uh, Portland in, in Oregon, did you feel like you wanted to, like, go through a hero's journey by becoming this criminal and then going through prison and stuff. Cause I feel like that's a very common thing for a lot of people is that they want to go past being a regular person. They want to have gone through some crazy shit that'll make them feel like they're a real accomplished person. And I saw it in his eyes right away that like, that was a good enough question that it made him really think about mm. his life. Yeah, that's good. And I was like, Oh shit. That's like, I just casually came up with like a question that despite all these hours of him doing podcast and nobody had ever really framed it like that for him. So but that's just hard. So like, and I, I did it without realizing I was doing it, but it's like to really get deep into somebody's story is, it's tough. But I feel like a lot of times doing shit that's like kind of negative is it's, it's, it's going to make you hated by the guests, yeah. which is like, it's a risk you take, but a lot of times it's not really worth the risk. It's like, you would rather just form relationships and maybe do not softball interviews, but stuff that doesn't necessarily go to the 
most unpleasant shit, you know? See, for me, it's not even about like being a negative. It's like I try to paint a picture of who you are. Mm. And sometimes for somebody to learn who you are, we got to talk about how you persevere through the, the negative shit. It ain't mm. a, to highlight the negative shit, but it's like, yo, I'm a human. Mm. It's to really paint the human side of you. So, like, okay, you might look at me as a superhero, but I went through this shit and that shit was hard and I got, got through it like this. Right? So it's not a, a lot of times to paint the, the negative picture, but what happens is some artists, especially the younger ones, mm. they don't know how to articulate a, 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 a thought or an opinion to be able to talk about how they really feel about it so it looks negative. And, and that's the difference between interviewing like people in their 30s versus interviewing a 19-year-old. Facts. More often than not, the 19-year-old is not going to give you like a 10-minute fascinating answer. You're going to have to have 50 fucking questions written down because he might give you one minute of an answer or less per each question, you know? But all right, I'll give you another example. The baby. The baby killed somebody in Walmart. We all know the story. He told the story on DJ Vlad, and then he told the story on The Breakfast Club. It's like, really, nobody should ever ask him that question again. If I had him for an interview, I met him. I hung out with him a little bit. He wore, my, wore a no jumper jumpsuit in a in a music video, which is sick. But uh, you know, I wouldn't ask him that. It's like, how many times is he going to do an interview where he has to describe this horrible, traumatic thing of killing somebody? You know, it's like I feel like as an interviewer, there's levels to this shit. And if you do an interview where you just ask the same ass shit that everybody always asks, you're only going to get to a certain level. But you should also be aware of and observe every other interview that's happened before because, like, they're they're kind of just automatically going to – I could just imagine the eye roll I would get from the baby if I asked him about killing that guy in Walmart because he's going to be thinking, man, that's some old shit. Depending like, on how you ask it, though. Like, I did an interview with Lil Mama. We talked about the Jay-Z shit, and that shit went crazy. And everybody talked like – I'm going to be real, though. I don't, I don't think she's kept it real and talked about that shit in many, many years. So I feel like oh, – okay. Yeah. That shit went crazy. I, I, I honestly might go search that later and watch it because I don't think I've seen it. And that honestly has to be one of the craziest moments in hip-hop history. Has, and I didn't even know. <laughs> I forgot that that was the same day that Kanye West went. I did not know that until she brought it up. I'm like, shit. And it would have got so much more attention if it wasn't the, the night that Kanye did that to Taylor Swift. Yeah, <sighs> that's crazy. Yeah, that was crazy. Yo, okay. Again, I just want to ask you, bro. You never really answered it. When is it too much? When you got a wife, bro. You got a wife, you got a kid. When is it? It, it got to be a, a level when it's like, yo, you know what, man? I'm going to scale back some. Or do you think you got to see that for it to happen? I mean, I'm comfortable with everything I've done. Okay, I'm going to ask you again. So you can't be comfortable with everything. I mean, I'm comfortable with everything I've done. I feel like the issue is that a lot of other people are not comfortable with it because they are not as open-minded sexually, you know? So if it gets in the wrong hands, are you still comfortable? I'm comfortable. <sighs> Me and my girl are like, we don't get why everybody else thinks it's a big deal, you know? It's like uh, in the porn world... There's nothing controversial about us when it comes to that shit. And then the rap world, it's controversial. But that's not the world. That's what I'm saying. That's not the world. It's not just porn and rap, bro. Like, that's mm. not the, the Well, like, to me, that's the two businesses that I primarily exist in. Forget, can we ever say forget business at all or no? Well, we're talking about content. I think, see, I think that's where we differ. Because you don't do porn, so you don't understand that it's content. I ain't talking about porn. Fuck porn. I'm talking about doing on camera people... I'm talking about being a person. That's porn. People having sex on camera is pretty much the definition of porn, right? No, I'm not talking about business. Okay, move on. <laughs> I'm not talking about business. That's what I'm saying. Like I know. I just I already talked about this a bunch today. It's kind of boring. What, the the porn shit? Yeah, you can just keep bringing it up. It's just, I'm over it. My bad. It, it must have hit a nerve or something. No, there's no nerve. I just like I already talked about it two times with two other people, and I feel like I've kind of made it clear that I'm kind of over talking about it, and you keep drilling into it. I, I'm just trying to like pick your brain, I guess. I yeah, apologize. I'm just again. telling you, move on. Okay. My bad, Adam. So, okay, when we talking about we talking about young talent in, in the space. Mm -hmm. And we talking about them coming up. And you saying that like on one side, it's good to piss people off. I mean, 
if you want attention, it's good to piss people off. If you want to be well liked, that's a much more precise science. But it's been proven that if you get attention, you piss people off, you still level up. You level up in some ways, you level up in intention, but you don't necessarily level up in being well liked. And a lot of times being well liked will be way more advantageous. Like, you know, I'll give you an example. You got me and Desta Dub. We got stores side by side on Melrose. His business, he makes cool clothes, he gives them to celebrities, and then he creates, you know, content on social media showing how cool his brand is. It's easy as fuck for him to be well liked because he doesn't have to get on camera and talk about why he doesn't like somebody or talk about some drama or whatever. And I, and I admire that mm. for me, it's like a little different because at least the path that I've chosen, it's kind of like, I got to get on camera and talk about everything in the culture. So, you know, me and him are two guys that came up around the same time. I definitely get more attention because I'm controversial. He's definitely more well liked because he doesn't, you know, he, he just does good business. He makes cool shit. Light bulb. Real time, right? I'm going to edit everything out, right? But in this time, it's easy to, let's say, not have integrity, mm -hmm. right? In those moments, what matters the most to you? What moments? The moment we just had. Let's say, you say, edit some shit out. Mm -hmm. It's easy to be like, nah, I'm going to send this to, look, how, look, look, look at his reaction, right? Yeah. But the integral thing to do is like, nah, bro, if that's uncomfortable for him, bro, like, why would you? That's to me to post that is corny. You don't do that. But right. we've seen people come up in those situations. But doing an interview with somebody and like basically like respecting their wishes about what they want to talk about, I kind of feel like that's like bare minimum for a podcaster, right? Because it's like as long as two people are like consensually making content together, they should respect each other's boundaries. And even like in a situation like, you know, Black China walked out on me. She didn't ask me to not put it out. She just kind of accepted that it was what it was. She probably knew right away it was going to be viral, mm. you know? And it's like, if she had asked me to not put it out, it would have been a weird decision because it's kind of like, well, you wasted my time. You got me to do a damn interview and then you walked out after 10 minutes. And it's kind of like, I almost just feel like dropping that anyway because, you know, but it's like, and also probably that's the end of my relationship with Black China. Now, if I had given her the most softball interview possible, me and Black China might still be like this, you know? We might still do content sometimes and shit like that, but it's kind of like, you got to choose that path during the interview of like, do you want to, do you want to create a spectacle or do you want to maintain the relationship? Mm. I don't, see, I think, I guess the way I look at it is like, I don't care about neither. Mm. It's about me. And like, how, like, do I feel good about that? Like, I did an interview with somebody. They, they was like high as hell, and I didn't post it. And I'm like, yo, let's do it again. We did it again. They still ain't support me in no collab post or nothing like that. And and something happened later on, tragic, and I didn't post the first one. And I don't, I don't want to go too deep into it, but like, they all did. Yeah, that's a tough one. Yeah, but I, and I'm glad I didn't post that. Mm. But it's like those be the moments where it's like I know that would have went crazy. Mm. Even before that happened. Yeah. No, that is a tough one. I mean, for sure with me, if I had like unreleased footage of somebody being super fucked up and then they died of being on drugs, I wouldn't drop it. That would be. But that's also why I like just I drop everything I do. So mm. nobody can really tell me like, oh, like you drop this and you didn't drop that. It's like I, I make it clear. I don't give a fuck if you're my best friend. If you crash out on the podcast, we're posting it. Because mm -hmm. especially if it's live. I mean, if it's live, then it's like it's out of our hands. It's like I don't even have to post it. It's going to be everywhere without me posting it, you know? Um, but, yeah, you just got to figure out, like, what makes sense to you. But I wouldn't encourage people to just, like, burn every bridge for the brief glimpse of clout, you know? It's just it's not really worth it. Yeah, you said um, – okay, pivot off, off of that. You said – Kendrick Lamar should drop, I mean, Drake should Drake. drop the hardest diss song right after Kendrick Lamar performs at the Super Bowl. Right. I think that's the only chance he has of making that moment about something besides just Kendrick smearing him and destroying him on stage to 100 million people. It's like, I feel like Drake <laughs> might be wise to harness that moment and drop the best shit that he ever dropped. Okay, 
for me, I don't really give a fuck about the diss. But do you understand what's happening? Like, do you understand? Because you're, you hip hop commentary. Do you understand how the people are feeling right now about Kendrick Lamar performing at the Super Bowl in New Orleans? Yeah, I think they're fucking upset. What, you think they're happy? No, I think they're upset. Yeah. I think I, I think that the initial reaction actually watching this play out over the last couple of days was like, fuck yeah, Kendrick at the Super Bowl. That is sick as fuck. Then everybody starts immediately thinking like, well, it's New Orleans. It's in New Orleans. <laughs> New Orleans has a beloved musical history. There's all these greats, and we would love to see them on stage at the Super Bowl. And then we start thinking, well, why Kendrick over Lil Wayne? Oh, wait, how does who's in charge of the Super Bowl? Oh, Jay-Z. How's Jay-Z feel about Drake? How's oh shit? So we're like two days removed from that, or maybe one day removed from that yeah, announcement. Like and already the fucking public opinion of it, I feel like has changed so much. Now, granted, like the average hip hop fan might not be deep enough in the weeds to be like giving a fuck they might just be like oh Kendrick the Super Bowl that's cool but shit today alone you see Nicki Minaj and Boosie unloading on Jay-Z now granted they didn't really say Jay-Z's name because I think they live in fear of him I don't know what's up with that bro he's the boogeyman he's the real boogeyman in this game and I've seen it before too I I had somebody tell me that they were doing an interview with the whole ASAP mob back in the day and somebody like the host made a little joke about Jay-Z and they all just silent they all knew so maybe I should be more scared of like the industry because I'm like, even me, Jay Z never did nothing for me, and I still like really hesitated before. I, I I was thinking about tweeting some shit about how Jay Z is the boogeyman, and then I was just like, you know what? Damn, I don't know. He got that Jay Prince aura, but for the whole industry, Jay Prince is that for the streets more. But like, really, Jay Z got that for the whole fucking world. Yeah, no, nah, you're right. You got everybody's it. scared of him. It's like my favorite rapper of all time too, and I'm scared of him. I'm gonna be straight up. I just think I don't know. I didn't like the decision because like. Bro, why not? We had LA. We had the Super Bowl in LA. Mm. And we had a whole LA tribute down there. That's what I'm saying. Why wouldn't it be Lil Wayne? You could just put Master P, Juvenile, it's fucking Lil Wayne. Not to mention bringing out Drake and Nicki Minaj and throwing the whole Young Money Cash Money thing in there. I mean, they could have made a movie. But shit, that wouldn't give Kendrick a chance to get one over on Drake in front of the biggest audience of the world. So, so you think I mean, it was intentional? Hell yeah. I mean, Jay-Z got a, a reputation for being petty. And this is the pettiest shit I ever seen. He too old for this shit. I think I seen Cam and Mason. <laughs> he's too old to be being petty. He loves petty. this shit. Bro, he's too old to be being petty, bro. But if you're going to be in hip-hop and you're going to make it into your 50s, I think you got to be kind of cutthroat. You got to be kind of petty. You got to really still want to smash on your ops, even if after you're rich. This is where the fucked up plays, bro. <laughs> nah, I ain't, for real, y'all for real. give me no. Like, I have no hope. Like, I feel like you gotta be a fucked up person to just get to the top. Like, that's fucked up. That's not true. Like, I'm here to prove you niggas wrong. Man, but when you look at Jay Z and all the moves he's made throughout his career. It's like, there's a lot of, it's a lot of impressive shit that makes me look at it and think, you know what? If I got a, a grudge against somebody, I might not just let that shit go. Mm. I might let that shit rock for 10, 20 years. I ain't mad at that. Yo, <laughs> I was thinking about... I, 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 I got to dip in like you 10, got 10 minutes. minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to ask you, because I ain't never get a chance to talk to nobody about this. When you look at the uh, those little lists, like the end of the year, list, like complex lists, mm -hmm. complex lists, do you feel like it's, it's, it's valid, it's validity in, in, in those lists? Uh, No, and that's why I never really talked about it on camera. Like I've seen uh, Vlad and Elliot Wilson do like a whole breakdown of exactly what his feelings were on every single person on the list. And I hate it because it's like I can't really even... Like that that's something where I'll play the safe route is like I, I can't talk about people's positions on that list because as soon as I start talking about I, I believe me, I have very strong opinions about Why you can't every talk about single person because me talking about it would offend like fifteen or twenty people on that list as soon as I started saying that they don't belong to be Why do you they, care? Because I have like real relationships with these people. So you don't Okay. So but, you don't care about but not relationships that are so secure that I could say like you're not in the top 25. Nobody wants to say that about people that they really respect that they got like long standing relationships with like uh, you know a lot it's, of them it's, it's just not, not in worth the top it. 25, bro. Oh yeah, for for me too. I mean, I could tell you some some grave omissions. And Sean, there's some Sean, legends in, and, and it's some legends in there. Sean not, Cotton? Yeah, that, that that list pays an overt amount of attention <clears throat> to Age and seniority. 
I, and that's how I felt. I, I yeah. said the same as that. And I feel like, and, and a little bit of proximity as well. But, it being but in New then York. some of them are weird too, because it's like, you know, Kids Take Over has been making waves. They've done a lot of dope shit. They get a lot of underground interviews that are admirable. And I respect the fuck out of what he's been building. But you cannot tell me for a goddamn moment that his shit is as big as Say Cheese or as important as Say Cheese. Yeah. Say Cheese is like, he might not do the most content, but he does like the right content at any given moment. He, Bro, gets, he just did he, the, uh, he gets Rallo the people. interview. Right, he it's did Rollo, he did Fulio's mom. He did, I, I can't even think of everything. But, you know, he. Th there's always somebody I want that Sean Cotton manages to weasel his way into getting first because he doesn't do that many interviews, so he can just hop on a flight, boom, he's in Florida. He's interviewing this person that... If I wanted to interview them, I would have to cancel 10 interviews on my schedule to go get that interview. Mm. And I think he also does a remote, remote interviews, which is a, a yeah, major cheat code that Vlad kind of originated, you know? And I was going to say, I think, I feel like Vlad fucked the game up with pan niggas like this. Yeah. I asked to get an interview like, yeah, so you got it. Like, bro, I'm just starting. I don't got no $20,000 for you. That's what they told me when we were coming here. Remo said, Remo said, honestly, he's like, I hit up a bunch of people. They all want to get paid. He said, even No Neck J want to get paid. Damn. I, I get like, paid to Damn. do interviews, but like, that's, if, if you try, if you like, I don't know, trying to promote your business or some shit. I, I feel like asking for like 500 or 1,000. Let's, let's normalize asking for like an amount of money that's enough for you to get like the big body Uber and Zaxby's after. Yeah. You know, it's so often that somebody is supposed to do an interview and it's like 10,000. I'm gonna have to get like two million fucking views <laughs> to make it worth it. You just you, you just did an interview. It got 200k. You know, even a thousand is a shitload for an interview uh, that's gonna get 200k. But then it depends on the platform. Like we just seen Marlon Wayans like talking popping shit, but then he go on uh, Shay Shay. I think they had like three million. I think. Yep. It really depends on the platform, which still might not hit the 40k that was uh, yeah, requested. Right. You know, well, almost certainly wouldn't hit 40K. Although, Act, Act told Vlad that you get better ads when you're a big channel like Sh Club Shay Shay. And that those ads sometimes can pay way more than the ads that we get. When I heard that, I was like, oh, shit, I never even thought of that. So, you know, but ultimately, like, all right, look at the... And that's why I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you with this. The most important thing, yes, you can build a platform. That's very important. You have to build additional businesses that run alongside because... Shannon Sharp, let's say, like, hypothetically, let's say you had to pay 40K for that interview. It's all good. How much is he getting from the liquor sponsor? I don't think he paid shit. How much? He probably didn't, but how much is he, because it's off respect. Yeah. How much is he getting from the liquor sponsor? How much is he getting from prize picks? How much is he getting from all these other different partnerships? Not to mention he's putting his content on Facebook. Not to mention he's putting it on Snapchat. He, he probably could have paid him 40K, no big deal. No, but he probably did it off the love. But, like, you have to have all these different parts of your business humming along in order to even be in this game because I see what's happening to a lot of my peers, like people who are hard asses about not paying for interviews. Some of them are kind of getting left behind. And I uh, shall not name names, but... Like that, interviewers. Yeah, I mean... I think that's... I ain't gonna lie, I feel like... I don't got it, but I feel like that's my <laughs> next level. But it's like, bro, I don't got no motherfucking... I don't got it. You know what would be the best thing? is if you could do a YouTube video, do it as a collab post on YouTube, and you figure it out in the back end. What you mean? Like, uh, you know, say I'm going to interview fucking oh, that No Neck Jake fire. or uh, No Neck J. And they get paid too. And, and instead of me giving them money up front, I just say, hey. You get 80%. Boom, we're going to do 50-50 on the back end. That's so It's funny that you said and that. And he, he could get paid for it forever. That's hard. That's hard. That's hard. Because the accounting would be too much of a pain in the ass for us to do that. Because then it's like a year later what I'm going to send him a check for $10 every month. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, but but if you were able to do that on the back end, because that's how it is in music. I was going to ask Bees you and Rilo do a song together. It's like they, they, they don't have to worry about like how are we going to split up this 50K that we made from the song. That's crazy. It's, it's funny because like shit. I was going to ask you like if you could plug me with somebody and I'll give you a rev share. But it's like, how do you even, you can't even. Yeah. But I feel like you two might do that at some point. They got to. It makes sense. Yeah. But man, I appreciate you for pulling up, bro. I know you got uh, no fight doubt. and shit. Yeah. Hopefully we can do this again. I got way more questions, bro. For sure. Like, but let's do it, man. I appreciate it. Already. Adam22. My guy. J Hill. J Hill Podcast. It's a wrap. We out.